You are listening to Middle East Monitor Conversations, bringing you lively discussions with prominent voices from the region and beyond as we delve deeper into issues shaping the Middle East and North Africa, from politics to culture and the arts. Hello and welcome to this week's conversation with Middle East Monitor. Everyone, my name is Anjuman Rahman and I'll be hosting this conversation with Hassan Kontar. Welcome Hassan and thank you for your time to join us today. Thank you for having me. Okay, so Hassan is a Syrian refugee who made headlines in 2018 after he was stranded in Malaysia's international airport for up to seven months. And it's an experience which he documented and later became an author of Man at the Airport, How Social Media Saved My Life, One Syrian Story. But last month, Hassan, you received the Canadian Canadian citizenship. So congratulations to you. That was heartwarming news to hear. Thank you. Um, but Hassan also, it hasn't been easy. Um, it's been a roller coaster of an experience and you've been forced, like millions of other Syrians, you've been forced to flee your home in war-torn Syria. Um, you know, I researched that you were originally from Asweda in Syria. Um, uh, that's where you spent your childhood. And so maybe tell us a bit about your childhood, you know, introduce yourself and tell us about your childhood and of your experiences from there. Well, uh, as exactly as you said, uh, it, it's the story of millions of Syrians, and that's what uh, Syria used to be before the war. Uh, it used to be a, a civilized, uh, peaceful, uh, quiet place where people were into uh, uh, farms, education, and skills worker. Uh, we were a family of five, um, and. Um, middle level family with a father who used to be a mechanical engineer, a nursing uh, mother who used to be a nurse. Uh, the three of us are children, are, are uh, uh, educated with a university degree. Um, so it, it, we had a farm and olive farms. Uh, we used to work during the weekends while uh, during the week we go to schools, universities or do some work. So it, it was peaceful. The time was uh, not... Uh, uh, and uh, not that important. Uh, life was simple, um, with uh, people just uh, trying to uh, um, to survive or to build a future. Uh, Syria, however, even before the war, uh, it, it was not a place for dreamers, for people who you want to achieve something uh, in their life, uh, financially or otherwise. Uh, so, um, like a lot of. Syrian youth, they uh, they uh, um, emigrated, they, they travel normally to the Gulf Peninsula where they can find a job and start building their future. So that, that was my life as a child. I'm, uh, I have another uh, uh, brother and one sister who is older than me. Uh, the last time I saw Syria, I visited Syria and saw my family was late 2008. Uh, so now it's almost 15 years and uh, uh, a lot happened during that time. Yeah, um, a lot, <laughs> more than a lot. Um, you've been one through one heck of a journey, but how did it end up with you being in an airport? I mean, we, we hear Syrian refugee stories and, you know, um, they either stranded at borders or refugee camps and, so on. You ended up in an airport, but I believe you were in the UAE for 11 years um, uh, bef um, before you end up in the airport. So how did you ultimately decide the airport is where I'm going to stay? And what was your uh, thought process? Or uh, you were left with no choice. You were, uh, but yeah, I did not decide the airport. The system decided for me. Uh, others who were fighting for power decided for me. Uh, I was uh, in no control of my own destiny. Um, I did not choose to stay at the airport, but I was running out of option. I tried everything. So uh, when I uh, left uh, Syria for the first time, it was 2006, I left to United Arab Emirates and I started working as an insurance marketing there until 2011 when the Syrian war uh, uh, started. Uh, I refused to join the army, so I lost my war permit uh, because I could not renew my passport. So from that time, 2011, I became illegal immigrant. 
Uh, I spent years being homeless, jobless, and uh, after that they detained me and they uh, sent me to, deported me to Malaysia as it is one of a few countries who accept Syrians on arrival visa for three months. After that, I tried to leave uh, to Ecuador because in the refugee world, we have something called the 1951 Refugee Convention, which a refugee can seek asylum in the signatory countries. Uh, Malaysia, unfortunately, was uh, not one of the signatory of the convention. So um, I tried Ecuador, but uh, I could not, Turkish Airlines did not allow me to board because of my nationality. Again, I tried uh, Cambodia, but uh, they did not accept my entry and they sent me back to Malaysia. And that's when I found myself without any other option. And I stuck it there. How, how did you survive? Like, how did you come to accept it yourself that this is your situation? And I, I, knew, I knew that I'm in a, in a deep, serious trouble. And I know I knew that at that time that the only uh, reasonable uh, solution is to send me back to Syria, where I have no idea what's going to happen there because I'm wanted. So um, I decided to fight back and uh, um, not to accept it. The minute I found a purpose, a goal that I'm going to fight this, uh, it did not bother me where I was at, at, uh, anymore. Uh, and I kept reminding myself that I did not hear of anyone who died because he was sleeping uh, on chairs or uh, uh, at the floor. Um, uh, it was tough. It was long, but I had a goal. And it was to tell uh, the story of my people and how the system is, is, isn't working, and how the international law failed us as uh, uh, Syrian refugees. Social media plays a significant role in you sharing your story. What sparked the idea that this simple tool will help you to deliver your story? And yeah, how did it? How did it change your life since then when the second you opened up social media and you started documenting your life? And it was how did that lead you to write your book later as well? Uh, it was a desperate solution, mm -hmm. uh, social media. Um, uh, first, when I uh, tr uh, found myself trapped at the airport, I tried uh, uh, to reach out to NGOs, uh, to uh, United Nations, to Human Rights, Amnesty, all the NGOs, uh, sometimes even to foreign embassies in Kuala Lumpur, uh, public figures, uh, tried everything, emailed everyone, uh, but it did not work. And I found myself, I knew that, okay, I'm on my own. And that's when I decided to, uh, uh, to go to the social media just to tell the story. Uh, and uh, if I'm going down, I'm not going without a fault fight without telling my story. And that's why I went uh, to the social media. From that point forward, it was not my personal story. Uh, it was uh, the story of my people. Uh, that's why my first tweet was, what does it mean to be a Syrian? Because at that moment, I knew that the world is judging me because of my nationality, not because of my own crimes or mistake. It was not Hassan the individual. It was Hassan the Syrian. And uh, that, that's why I went to social media. Uh, it was my window to the, to the world. And I used the skills, uh, as limited as they are, to, to, uh, to tell my story, uh, to be optimistic, not to complain, but to explain, not to sell the story, but to tell it. And uh, um, I, I, was, I was trying. And that was my last solution. It's been like, it's been over 10 years, nearly coming up to 10 years since then, since you've left your country anyway. Has, has anything changed since then, the process to finding a new home and starting a new life? Or is the experience still the, remaining the same for everyone who's still fleeing? Uh, for the Syrians who are still behind, who are still there, yeah, it's still the same. It's more difficult now. Uh, because uh, uh, the Syrian war and uh, the, the refugee crisis has been forgotten. And we, uh, it's, it's the cycle of the news where we have something else, so we will forget. We will not solve the old issues, but we will forget. We will ignore them and we will move on. So for the Syrians, it's especially after the Ukrainian war, uh, it's, uh, it's more uh, difficult and um, 
where uh, people just give up after 11 years. Even people uh, who could make a difference, like the people from the West uh, or the media, it's an old news now. Uh, so it is more difficult uh, now than before. For me, on a personal level, um, I think I'm one of the luckiest because I found uh, my home. And uh, I believe that refugees, we belong into two different worlds, two different cultures. And home is we where uh, feel that we belong and we have a value as individuals, dignity, rights, and obligations. Uh, when, uh, when I felt that here in Canada, I knew that uh, we, uh, we have uh, two countries, the one we gained by birth, which we love and uh, we wish peace and uh, uh, happiness and success, and the one we choose to have as home and uh, to belong to, and that's what Canada is for me. So did you choose Canada? Is Canada where you've always wanted to come or? It was not at the airport. At the airport, Canada was not on my uh, my wildest, uh, even my wildest dreams. Uh, uh, because I thought at that time that I don't have what it needs to come to Canada. And I did not know anyone in Canada, but they uh, reached out to me when they heard my story on social media and they offered help. And they were the only people despite the fact that I was on the global news and in, in languages I did not even know that it's out there. Uh, Canadian were the only one who actually reached out with, with uh, an actual real official uh, documents to sign and to help me. So from that moment on, I knew I was connected to this land. And now after four years, I uh, more than ever, What's been making you feel most at home while you're in Canada? Is there a place you go? Is there people, a person you've met? Or what's made you, what makes you feel at home in Canada? I read a piece you wrote recently, actually, where you said you start off your mornings with a cup of Turkish coffee and songs to, of Beirut. Was that your typical morning routine back in Syria as well? Or is this a new that's habit? Not, that's, yeah. That's, uh... For all the people in the Middle East, and I even created my home here, my own ward, my papal, uh, to look like exactly like home. Uh, the, the same smell of food, the Turkish coffee, the, the music, it's, uh, it's uh, the reminder uh, of my roots and the people I left behind. But uh, on a personal level, because I was, uh, uh, I, I understand that life is about priorities. And all what I was asking for is, my minimum human rights as, as a human being and to have a place where I can call home or be permanently safe and legal. Uh, and uh, Canada gave me that all in, in one package. Uh, and it helped me even build a career now uh, here in Canada. And uh, But on, uh, on a general note, uh, it's the people, uh, the Canadian people um, who, uh, believe in diversity, calm people, polite most of the time. And uh, they, they believe in diversity. They welcome everyone with open arm where we embrace uh, 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 different cultures and different, different uh, civilizations. So uh, I think it's the people most of them. Well, they say the happiest people are in Canada. They say Can Canadian people smile the best as well. So it must be for a reason. <laughs> Um, going back to your stay at the airport, because it's such a unique experience with its challenges. Because when I think of airports, I think it's the one place where you witness every emotional emotions possible. You know, people cry, people laugh, people are being reunited, people are being separated, people are breaking down, people are in a rush, people are taking time. I'm wondering, is there anything anything you witness or a spectacle that has stuck to you or a feeling you remember of after watching everything that's going on around you how, what it made you feel whether remembrance of your families or hopes of reun reuniting or having a destination to go to eventually it's what, it's what we call it's what we call now these days after covid we call it now social distance and I believe I was in this social distance uh, uh, long before the, the world did. Uh, there was a time when, uh, when a reporter from The Guardian uh, visited me at the airport uh, to make, he wanted to write an article uh, about me and he could not find 
my place. So we end up in different sides of the uh, glass wall. And he was taking a photos for me through the glass wall. So we could not even sit. And that was exactly what we call now social distance. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's the social distance for me where everyone is in rush uh, at the airport to get out or to get on the plane. Um, people who are angry because their flight has been delayed for a couple of hours. Um, it's fun when you look at it uh, these days or at this moment. Um, it's the people who look, uh, who used to look uh, at me like uh, a zoo animal um, because I was in the news. So uh, I think, I think it was for me, it was hope and determination. And, uh, once I found the purpose and well, the cause I was fighting for, uh, it did not bother me any anymore where I was, and uh, I discovered that. It's the journey who inspired others. It's not the distance, uh, the, the destination. Uh, it's the journey, uh, not the destination. And um, it's who, who we become uh, while marching towards our dream is more important than the dream itself. So it changed me forever. Now I'm more calm uh, and nothing will surprise me anymore. I understand life differently. I am more uh, slow and uh, I have more appreciation to the little things in life. It's all about the moment now, isn't it? Enjoying the moment, the here and the now. Not anticipate what's going to happen in the future. Okay, and um, do you mind sharing? Obviously, you've been going after challenges, after challenges, after challenges, and you know, experiencing um, the downsides of the countries you've ended up in as well. And, you know, you've seen the best, you've seen the worst. I'm guessing. What was the most challenging thing that you experienced and how did you train yourself to navigate through it? And what was the lasting lesson you've learned from it? Uh, it's, uh, there was a day at the airport where uh, I woke up in the morning and I was just walking around like always. It was almost 10 a.m. in the morning at the airport. And that's when I knew that ISIS attacked my city uh, the same day. And uh, we lost 250 people. Most of them are women and uh, children. Um, and at that moment, I, I, for the first time, witnesses what does it mean to be absolutely powerless and hopeless. And um, you start wishing that all the Marvel movies are actually true because you could uh, fly back on time or uh, tax yourself or using an Iron Man suit or whatever just to be there at that moment uh, to do what you can to help. Uh, so I think uh, even, even words like hope or dream, or love, or uh, desperation, or powerless, all of our voiceless, or uh, uh, um, I think we we use them a lot, or even thank you, we use them a lot these days. So it 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 become uh, it becomes a figure of speech. We don't actually mean it sometimes. Uh, we don't understand what it means. And, uh, then when when you face a situation where you at uh, the bottom or the lowest moment in your life, you will discover a new level of being uh, hopeless or or uh, or even hope. Uh, so I think I that's what I learned the most. It's it's to rediscover uh, um, myself and rebirth. Okay. Um. I'm I'm sorry you had to go through all that. I am, I really am. Um, what do you say, I know you're with um, Canadian Red Cross um, now. What what have you been doing with them? What have you been staying busy with them? And what have you been discovering about Canada through them? Or have oh, you found oh, especially about British Columbia, a lot. I have been all over the place for the last three years. And um, but I left, I uh, also uh, spent more time in hotels than I spent in my own home for the last three years. Uh, uh, 
all across the, the province, which is a big one. <laughs> but um, I am, I'm now working as a case manager in flood recovery department. I used to be an emergency care worker, um, uh, helping with the, with the, with the vaccine. Uh, or collecting samples for COVID-19. Then uh, for, for some times I was uh, in each VSS supervisor, safety and well-being. Uh, but now I'm a case manager with, uh, with flood recovery. We are trying to help communities who get affected by flood, which is great for me because it gives me the opportunity to pay back to the community who, uh, who welcomed me and gave me a chance. So uh, I think it's, it's quite an experience. And, uh, but uh, down the road at the end, I would, uh, because I am a former refugee and I always be, um, the, the ultimate goal uh, dream is to work in a refugee camp somewhere in the near future. Now I have my passport and I will be able to travel. So I'm going to seek that opportunity um, to, to go back to a refugee camp. Okay. Um so reflecting on your experiences and, you know, staying busy with the um, advocacy work that you're doing now as well and helping others and giving back in the way that you are, what is it that you wish more people to know or be more educated about regarding the common Syrian refugee experience and, you know, based on your treatment and what could have been different if just... That, the that's, that's why I wrote the book because uh, the media helped creating a, a stereotype, a pattern for the Syrians. So whenever you hear the, the, the word Syria now on the news or refugees, uh, the peoples uh, without fault of their own, that it will jump into refugee camp, unskilled people, uh, um, uh, people who are desperate for help, uh, dirty kids, no schools, uh, no health care, no, no hospitals, and uh, a crisis, which is uh, with a lot of tents and mud and uh, situation and misery uh, where people will just distance themselves from such a, a negativity. But um, they, the, that's why I wrote the book, because they never uh, heard from us directly and knew who we really are. Um, we are uh, seeking asylum or help, yes, but to turn it into an opportunity and how we are skilled people who could be an additional value uh, to any community they live in with skilled people who are capable of uh, uh, do a lot of things. Um, to close the gap between the East and the West and uh, to, uh, to uh, um, build a bridge between our two cultures. And uh, um, for me, uh, to introduce them to a different new type of racism, when people speak about racism, they speak about, they define it with uh, gender, color, race, religion. Uh, um, uh, uh, but I think there's a fifth, uh, fifth type of racism, geographical one, uh, to be born on uh, the wrong side of the world. And that's your all, only crime, where you will be subjected to racism, segregation, discrimination, and even the system is uh, will, will not play fair with you. Uh, so uh, just to educate people about who we really are, about the refugee crisis, and to teach them what they should do in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hassan, well, thank you so much. You've added great insight to your experience. Is there anything you would like to add or share that maybe I, I think, uh, Yeah, no, thank you very much. That was great. Okay. Uh, thanks for giving me the space to answer the question. No, thank you. And, you know, I wish you the best of luck for your future and the new life you're creating in Canada and, you know, and keeping your roots and still celebrating that. So good luck. Thank and you. again, congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Speak to you soon. Bye -bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. This was Middle East Monitor Conversations, brought to you by the Middle East Monitor in London.